Morning all. Let's carry on uh, looking at Capablanca game examples. Um, for the previous game, by the way, yes, I, I think maybe the lead up in my intro to that game, I should have emphasized really that uh, Frank Marshall had, um, rumor has it, prepared the Marshall Gambit specifically for Capablanca, so it was kept under wraps. So remember, he had lost that match um, eight, nine years previously to Kappa. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, he had purposely designed it to, to really test Kappa's metal, you know, his intuition, his, his apparent, you know, just, you, you know, lack of not doing too much work. So it was highly tactical potentially. And it's amazing really that Kappa's intuition steered him through that complexity of that game to be able to eventually refute the attack and create a very dangerous winning, uh, B pawn. Okay. But now we're going to go to other Kappa, Kappa game examples. Um, so these two are beautiful, the, the ones I'm going to show you now, uh, this one and the next one, from a kind of left-right hook perspective. Imagine this was a boxing match. This is a kind of left hook, you know, queen side punch, you know, right hook, king side punch. But also, you know, look at the central grip, um, the particular key squares kept under tight control. So if you forget all the variations I mentioned in these games, um, I just want to emphasize uh, the aesthetic concepts which these two games will demonstrate. So left, right hook, strong grip on central squares. This one shows also Kappa repairing his own pawn structure, not being scared to have double pawns because he, he, he recognizes the fluid nature of pawn structure and how it can be repaired. Uh, so this swinging, you know, of pressure, um, with, with domination of, of, you know, a grip, kind of Pillsbury bind grip on the position. Um, so those are the concepts which I hope you, you'll taste from these two game examples. So this one in particular really impressed me when I first saw it. I think it was in 500 Master Games of Chess. So we're going to flip the board from Kappa's perspective. David Janowski versus Capablanca in New York 1916. So d4, knight f6, knight f3, bit of a boring move. Okay, Kappa reacts classically, being in the classical school of chess, you know, not hypermodern, puts a pawn in the center, none of this hypermodern rubbish. Okay, that was a joke by the way. So c4, c6, okay, we have the dreaded Slav defense. Very, very popular today. We have it though with uh, Bishop F5 now. Okay, Bishop F5, which sometimes can leave uh, B7 vulnerable, or sometimes even that can be a gambit. Let's not get into the variations too much, but White did try and exploit B7 immediately with Queen B3. So this forced the structural concession for Kappa. Was it the end of the world? Well, the game shows it wasn't. Uh, so we'll see. Queen b6, inviting not only double pawns, but those double pawns to be made even bearer away from other parts of the pawn structure. Because after queen takes a takes, white now plays c takes d5, not only inflicting double pawns on kappa, but also taking this adjacent pawn away, dragging it away. So what was this opening a complete disaster from Kappa? Should he be in spending too, more time learning opening theory to avoid such an ugly looking pawn structure? These are the questions. So C takes D5. What has he got in compensation? Well, he's got obvious compensatory factors like the A file. Um, these pawns, you know, potentially C4 on the C file is, is going to be interesting. There's a double effect that you know if this pawn can be can be dissolved or something then there's the pawn behind it of course <laughs> so th the way we look at double pawns is challenged by this game it really impressed me at the time are they ugly are they dynamic can we use them as trump cards even to to sort of uh, show that you know often things are not you know although ugly looking they're often effective so White plays e3, another super solid move, maybe content and smug with his position, that he's inflicted structural damage. The smugness is going to be wiped off his face during the course of this game. So knight c6, and after bishop d2, we see a very deep move now. Well, many commentators have commentated it being a deep move. It just facilitates this wonderful plan, 
really, to undouble the pawns to make use of that c4 vulnerability. Look at the black rooks as well during this game. The left and right hook, as I would call it, which this game and the subsequent game I want to show you will demonstrate. So bishop d7. Bishop's done its duty temporarily on that diagonal. It's important now for b5 and c4 to, to be hanging around there. If this double pawn complex is going to be liberated, to be proven it's it's doing something that's not just ugly. So bishop e2. Kappa apparently suggested bishop b5 here. And also bishop d3 and king e2. Okay, e6. Now after castles, bishop d6. So what has Kappa got up his sleeve? After rook fc1, forget castling, don't need a routine move. The rooks can be connected and the king kept in the center for the end game here. So king e7. Now bishop c3. So, okay, white's position looks aesthetically pleasing, nice pawn structure. But bishop c3, a hint of passivity. And it seems, you know, black is able to systematically increase pressure on the queen side now. Rook hc8. And after a3, we definitely see evidence black's increasing the pressure. Despite the ugly double pawns, there now comes knight a5. Logically justifying also the bishop on d7. It will be hitting thin air on that diagonal. But on this diagonal, it logically supporting b5 and potentially knight c4. So these seemingly ugly double pawns are rearing their ugly head to create something interesting. Extra bind on key light squares in the position if there's a pawn which ends up on c4. Okay, so knight d2, f5, strong central grip. Pillsbury would be proud that his, his Pillsbury bind concept is being used here. But how many light squares c can cap a bind on? Not just these two, but maybe these two as well, if there's a black pawn here. Especially one of these previous to the uh, ugly ducks over here. This frontal double pawn, if that got to c4, there'll be extra binds on squares in the position. So g3, b5, it's coming up, supported by that bishop on d7, which seemingly wasted time earlier coming back to that diagonal. But supporting b5, and after f3, now we see knight c4. So, really the pressure is mounting now after this. That double pawn is really functional. It's difficult to kick this knight because of a3 being a, a terrible weakness, especially with black's blasting pressure down the a-file on it. Okay, so we can start to see this game as a sort of example also about structural considerations. You know, the evolution of style in the evolution of style, we would say Steinitz was picking up on, you know, accumulating small advantages, and and part of those might have been advantages in pawn structure. This is a sort of dynamic treatment of that that you can have double pawns as long as your compensatory factors can help you later, maybe heal that pawn structure or gain central control or pressure. So Bishop takes c4. White is actually losing, you know, his light squared bishop now. So black's actually gaining the trump cards, the, you know, the favourable imbalances. When I say trump cards, I think that's a nice term a lot of GMs use in commentating games, when they mean a favourable imbalance. So the trump cards now that black has are the, are the bishop pair, the light square bishop, the grip on the light squares. White's next move really doesn't do much. It's going to basically put more pawns on dark squares, this e4, if it's later moved to e5. So king f7, Cap is saying, okay, fine, you want to play e5, play e5. You haven't got the light square bishop, so my grip on the light squares is going to be ever more painful. Fine, put your pawn on the dark square. White, White's willing to as well, seemingly ga gaining a notional space advantage. You see, White's advantages in this game, they're, they're kind of superficial. It's like the variations catch up on them later to, to reveal that, you know, although bad looking, it was actually effective, the double pawns. Although you could say e5 seemingly gains space, it's ineffectual again because it provides a biting point later. If it has to be supported by f4, another biting point for black, for rooks, you know, later to use the g file, let alone the a file at the moment. So that left right hook movement 
or rather right to left in this game is, is going to be evident soon so bishop e7 and after f4 we have the prelude now this f4 the biting opportunity g5 can be kept in reserve used at the the right moment the most effective moment but first extra grip on the light squares a4 just in case white ever dared to play a4 so king f2 and now rook a4 as though maybe you know the rook's going to double and then b4 okay so king e3 rook c a8 immediate threat b4 has to be parried rook a b1 so white's been forced to passivity black's got Cap has got an amazing grip on quite a few light squares in the position. Now h6, revealing his intention, he's he's caused white to be quite passive on the queen side. Let's start working on the king side. So knight f3 and now g5. So opening up a second front. Maybe he would also be tempted at every moment to have, to have played b4, but he resisted that. White plays knight e1, and now rook g8. Maybe it's the you know the, he detects the extra flexibility of his rooks that they can just redouble quite quickly on the g file, and White's rooks seemingly passive, just waiting for something to happen on b and c1, standing spectators to this g file infiltration. So after king f3, Kaplan now took on f4, and now the rooks show their their mobility and coordination superiority on white's rooks so knight g2 and quickly doubling now on the g-file leaving this binding effect on the light squares white's still unable to play a4 there's this bishop as well putting that a4 break under locking key and if b3 you know with black having the light square bishop a taking taking here would, would give the bishop the diagonal anyway it would be pretty academic to try and play for b3 if bishop c6 is a good retort keeping control of b5 as well so white's just sitting there like a rabbit in the headlights now on this second front this g file infiltration coming up so rook g1 rook a g8 intensifying the pressure what are the immediate tactical implications well here maybe you know h5 h4 springs to mind with h3 being a major threat then if that knight is going to remain the pin piece that's the most obvious f4 is also a potential target we can imagine these kind of moves bishop h6 for f4 being a target if h3 is ever played of course there's rook g3 so white's under pressure now on the king side so bishop e1 and now we see actually a positional sacrifice from kappa to make sure this bishop is, is going to be more potent, more in the game. So b4 it invades via a zigzag movement into the white position with this pawn sack. So a takes b, bishop a4. The invasion of that bad bishop, could we say temporarily, behind its own pawns of the same colour? As long as it's inside the opponent's position and outside of its, you know, not, not kept a prisoner by its own pawn structure, that bishop uh, is going to be more effective anyway. So rook a1, bishop c2, it, it's invading. So it's a bit similar to the, the classic uh, Nimzo, Nimzovic uh, invasion when, when Kappa, who by the way has got 5-0 score it seems against Nimzovic, but one of the games, this Khan Khan advance variation, slow gradual infiltration, systematic. Uh, so this is a bit reminiscent of that now. So bishop e4, powerfully you know, central and inside the opponent's position. So numerous threats and possibilities now, like bishop takes g2s. Now h5, so h4, ominous threat, mounting pressure on g2, rook a7, and now combination, which is irresistible even for Kappa, who might want to avoid any combinations where the opponent's got some tricky resource or can complicate, but here it's a logical combination, culmination of pressure, which has been built up, exerted by all of these pieces. Bishop takes g2. So this real right hook punch on, on, on the king side, showing the extra mobility of the black rooks, is uh, causing now material gain after h4. Kappa is winning the exchange. Okay, he's provided a slight concession that white can play bishop h4 because of the pin. But he's the exchange up now. Takes the h2 pawn. 
Right. Okay, so white has rook e7 or, or bishop e7. He chooses actually to play bishop takes e7. On rook e7, I'm not sure. I don't really want to turn on an engine here. But I guess if king g6, there's rook e6. So maybe king f8 to force bishop f6. And then maybe taking on b2. I don't want to bore you too much with too many uh, variations here. White uh, took with the bishop. Okay, so check. Rook b3. So b2 is vulnerable. The bishop's not really that flexible enough to defend it. The rook really doesn't want to go back. So white used the discovered check. Bishop g5 discovered check from the rook. King g6. Rook e7 going for that vulnerable e6 pawn. But now the c4 pawn is very dangerous and quite advanced already, set to become a queen. Off the check, king f3. Now we see rook a8 actually. So it's not even about the c pawn now. There's an immediate threat of mating actually with the rooks. Because <laughs> the pawns are also providing a mating net for the white king. Okay. After rook takes e6 check, king h7. Actually, white can't defend this mating that, that easily. Um, he resigns here. Uh, let's see. Um, his checks will probably run out here. Um, but we should also look at king g3. Um, I think if king g3, the king's just driven to a mating net, basically. So the key thing, excuse my superficiality about the c-pawn being important, the key thing actually about taking on b2 is actually the coordination again of the rooks being the exchange up, just to weave this mating net now with rook a3. Okay. I thought that was an impressive game uh, myself. It made a deep impression on me at the time because of the seemingly ugly, you know, double pawns on the queen side. I think. Then in a lot of my games, I changed my view on playing things like Queen B6 myself. And probably a lot of players seeing this game also changed their view about the double pawns. You know, trying to qualify these generalizations to say, well, you know, Cap has shown that actually you can repair your pawn structure after Queen B6. So, you know, we, we increase our kind of, um, you, you know, it all depends attitude on, on the generalizations we make. You know, is it is it bad to have double pawns, etc., or I say queen's pawns? The game examples start to make us more and more dynamic that we can have, you know, like lawyers have, um, you know, base cases uh, to argue with. You know, chess players, we have past games to, ar to make our intuitive arguments, uh, to challenge our intuition to say that this isn't really as ugly as it seems. It's got dynamic potential. You know, Black's got not, not just superficially, uh, you know, pressure on the A file, but um, a liberating plan, you know, B5, trying to use the C file, trying to undouble, which could rest out trump cards like the two bishops, uh, or, or just extra rook mobility, you know, to switch from the, the queen side to the king side later, to leave the white rooks, you know, like spectators. Um, you know, just, 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 laying around, you know, uh, layabouts compared to the black rooks. So this, this dynamic potential um, starting, you know, from this bishop retreat, I think is, is very, very aesthetically pleasing to watch. So b5, we saw the undoubling of the pawns picking up the light square bishop trump card, which was really effectively used later by Kappa with that pawn sack we saw with the b4, with the bishop zigzagging right in uh, to the white position. So waiting for that knight not to be effectual on e4. So it takes the wriggling opportunity. Once the knight's kind of passive, we saw the knight kind of passive on g2. So Kappa's probably made a note, you know, of this zigzag maneuver for that bishop to get into the position as well, as well as, you know, his rooks being more adept to go from one side of the board to the other. So I think it's really just impressive positionally, the ideas of some of these master games. The sheer ideas is just, um, you know, amazing. I, I guess chess is like a reflection of, of, of culture generally, that, you know, the old films couldn't have special effects, but they had fantastic ideas. So although these games aren't 
terribly um, dynamic and te- technical and driven by like um, amazing innovations in the opening by by Rivka. The, the the positional ideas, especially of, of Capablanca, who's regarded as like you know the Mozart of chess by by many sources. This this fierce natural talent. The ideas he has here in this game, and I'll show you the the next game, the left right hook of the rooks. You know, going so quickly from one section of the board to another. Is is for me, you know, very very intuitively impressive. So the zigzagging in of the bishop once the, the knight can't do anything about e4, and then this h5 just just forcibly winning material really, and it's not about the past c pawn, you know, grabbing the b pawn now. It's about this this mating that which really easily finishes the game. So obviously Capablanca is not. Um, Got this thing on his back saying, "I'm I'm not going to go for your king." Obviously, he won a lot of games with king attacks, but his positional play was also brilliant in this game. So, uh, discovered check, and and now you know the mating that is is woven after rook b2 because of this rook a8, showing again, of course, the mobility of the rooks. You know, switching from one side to the other so so quickly. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. Please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.